Hello, and welcome back to the Wheel Talk podcast. My name is Abby Mickey. We're going off the rails this week. We we are Sans, Lauren, and Gracie, but I'm joined by Rebecca Charlton. Hello. Hello. I'm very excited. I'm so excited. I figured, like, we I've had you on the podcast before. We've chatted women's cycling. We chatted Ride London. But we didn't ever get to dive into a lot of other stuff that I think is really cool about you. So I thought, ah, man, we should just have a whole episode where we just kind of chat. And that's what we're doing. (laughs) That was so lovely. What a lovely introduction. I feel like I always go off at a massive tangent when I'm a guest on your podcast and we kind of have to just, we've run out of time. I think I think we went to a record length last time, didn't we? <laughs> Possible, yeah. I think we did. I think we did. I think I was in, in post, I was editing it and I was like, oh man, there's nothing I can cut. <laughs> it's just going to be a long episode. <laughs> I hope everyone else agreed. I'm sure that they loved it. I never got any bad feedback. And even if I do, I, I've instructed to to Kaylee, who receives the emails, the editor emails, to never forward me any bad feedback because my fragile self can't cope. Oh, that's that's a whole topic, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, we could talk. We could talk about being a female presenter, because and and maybe we should. But before we dive into that, th- this episode is brought to you by the members of the Escape Collective. Head on over to escape.com/slash/join, become a member. There's a bunch of cool stuff going on over there on Escape. We've got great coverage of cycling many different forms of cycling we got the best in tech like the best tech in the on planet earth i'm pretty sure um in james wong dave rome and ronan mclaughlin and then there's me covering the women's stuff so i'm over there writing about women's stuff (laughs) i got a newsletter if anyone's interested in reading a weekly newsletter about women's cycling it is this week i dive into the olympic selection which is a fascinating topic at the moment because everything is up in the air with that uh, and the number of riders going for each nation. Nations that have always had four are down to three. The rankings are wild and it's it's super fascinating. So head on over to, to escapecollective.com slash join or check out Escape Collective. The Wheel Talk newsletter is over there. Thank you so much. Always feels weird to plug myself. I was going to give a whoop, but I thought, you know what? I'll be professional. It's the beginning of the podcast. Maybe later. <laughs> I don't even know where to start because we have so much that we could talk about. So I want to start. Let's just start with riding through pregnancy because this is something that both of us did and not everyone can do it. It's it's like you have to be okayed by your doctor to be able to keep exercising. There are definitely people who who shouldn't try to ride through pregnancy, but I was watching Ellen Van Dyke just like continue her training all the way up until she gave birth. And I'm, I'm just so in awe of that. I, I stopped riding on the road. mm, I think when I was 18 weeks, I crashed my mountain bike and got a concussion. And I was like, I am pregnant. Like I'm terrified. So after that, I only rode Swift, which was um, which was like a godsend. Like I felt like all through pregnancy, I was losing who I was. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen next. Like, uh, this is crazy. My body's changing. I'm throwing up three times a day, but I still don't fade in my pants. Like it was just wild. And then every time I could get on a bike, it was like, I could kind of recenter myself. How did you find riding through pregnancy? And, and what was your experience with that? Yeah, I think, I think that sums it up in, in the way that you've just said, you just don't know what's next. And I think that I was just constantly adapting. And the biggest thing that I kept saying to people, because I was really publicly sharing my journey, I, it, I sort of said from the very beginning, you know, whatever happens, I'm going to keep talking about it as much as I can or as much as I feel comfortable to do. Um, because, yeah, it is such a huge unknown for your first pregnancy, um, especially when you're navigating sport and exercise, I think. And early on, I was, I don't know what came over me. I was so determined to actually ride even more. I think just because your body's changing rapidly. Um, for me, I felt very, very sick like you. Um, I was just like... Girls. It's when you're pregnant with girls. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that girls make you like have just the worst morning sickness but it's not in the morning it's uh, all day long it's a dumb way to call it to coin the phrase morning sickness a man I'm sick all the time and it got worse That's in the like... evening i was like this is not even and then people go oh just a little bit morning sickness and and do you know what when you watch like bridget jones's baby which i you know i have many many times obviously <laughs> you know about anyone other listeners it's a classic uh, yeah. it's a classic um but when you know 
Hollywood tells us that you go, you just get like a waste paper bin and you go, more. Mm. Oh, yeah. I must be pregnant. Oh, oh God. I just, if only. Yeah, and you're like sick yeah. once and it's all very cute. And, you know, it's horrendous. You're just all day just trying to manage carrying on feeling that sick. And for most people, me included, I don't know about yourself I didn't want to tell anybody until I'd got to my first scan and so you spend actually what feels like a really long amount of time lying to people and I went uh, I was presenting the women's tour coverage um on which goes on ITV in the UK and I was in the, the first trimester and nobody knew and I basically had to tell my producer before I had told anybody like my family didn't know no one knew like I so hadn't started telling people, but I was having to undo my jeans in like the transfer between the start and the finish of the stage. I, I was hanging my head out of an open window the whole time, disappearing to like be sick the moment I'd done an interview. And I think that's something people don't talk about enough is that when you're sort of made to feel like really we should just keep it to ourselves in the first trimester for so, so many reasons, it does mean that in what's arguably the hardest part of pregnancy, you're doing it on your own and you can't tell your colleagues, you don't feel you can tell your colleagues. And so, yeah, I just said to my producer one day, I, I feel like I need to, to mention this because my behaviour is so, so weird. Um, because, you know, I'm just trying to, to not be sick. But anyway, again, I've gone off at a tangent, but I think the biggest thing for me was it was an unknown and I wanted to continue to be active so I actually rode quite a lot but in in that period of time that I hadn't told people I was filming a series called The Bunny Hop all centered around women cycling and we did a studio show it was such an awesome show it was really cool oh thank you I absolutely loved hosting it and as you all know it was oh I really appreciate that because it you know when you just absolutely love putting something together and in between the studio shoots I was going out and riding with professional cyclists and doing on bike interviews and I was probably just coming I was probably towards the end of the first trimester so still keeping things to myself and I went riding with Katie Archibald and we did it and the whole sort of premise is we go to someone's home and meet them on their local roads and so where she is from in Scotland is fairly hilly <laughs> And as somebody that is not good on a hill anyway, um, I definitely used to stick to my racing on the track where it suited me. And so we were just going up hill upon hill upon hill. And it's one of those where you go, you know, is this is this the massive hill you mentioned? Oh, no, 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 this, is just, this isn't even the hill yet. And I was just absolutely hanging. And I just got on with it. And I was obviously a lot, lot, lot less fit than an olympic champion <laughs> um but it was it was one of those things where i kind of just thought i'll just carry on doing what i do and a lot of people tell you to do that in pregnancy and then i started um a sort of youtube documentary series to document my pregnancy um in line with the sport and i interviewed a wonderful gp called dr ralph mitchell that used to be an obstetrician and has delivered many 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 babies before he became a gp and he's also a really good cyclist and works in the sporting world as well and has been a sports doctor and i started this interview and he said well of course the most important time to rein it in and make sure you're not overdoing it and not overheating is the first trimester in particular the very early part of it and it seems crazy to me now that i wasn't armed with this information but i started to panic that i'd gone too hard i'd pushed it too much i'd overheated too much and he tried to reassure me by saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm sure you were only out for a potter on the road. And da, da, da. no, 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 I know I was out riding with uh, <laughs> multiple Olympic champions and trying to keep up. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously at the time I was worried I'd done the wrong thing. And he was very reassuring and he gave me so much data and statistics and said, do you know what? We do advise that people, you know, take it a little bit more in their comfort zone when they're cycling or doing any exercise in that first trimester. But he said, unless you've gone and sat in a sauna to the, you know, to breaking point, and then you've gone and done, uh, you know, um, a Zwift session to the point where you're overheating, he said, if you've done all these things in succession, then yeah, maybe you should start worrying. But he said, you know, you you have to kind of 
not panic too much about these things. He said, but, you know, if I had spoken to you earlier in the pregnancy, I would have said perhaps save the harder stuff till later on. And I think, I don't know about you, but what struck me with that is that I just got the assumptions completely upside down that when you've got this massive bump and you're really late in pregnancy and everyone says, oh, you should sit down, are you okay, are you okay? Actually, the effects of exercise on your pregnancy, although you might be less comfortable, all the um, you know all the important things happen in the first trimester, and that's actually the time mm-hmm. to, to be more cautious. And I just sort of felt like, God, should I have known all this? And and that's when I realised I don't think we talk about it enough. And uh, you know, let alone cycling. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting the whole taboo around talking about being pregnant in the first trimester because. For me, I can't keep a secret. So I I called my best friend actually before I called Tom's. Um, <laughs> he was, to in his defense, he was racing. So I couldn't exactly call him up and be like, hello, the pregnancy test came back positive. But um, but I called my best friend immediately. And I within five days, I'd told four other friends. Mm-hmm. Because in my eyes, I was like, if anything goes wrong, I need people to lean on. And... And if it's going to go wrong, it's going to go run now. So I've always been kind of, I don't, I, I wasn't like broadcasting it, but I do think that the whole, the whole taboo around not telling anyone in that first trimester is very old school. And it's just not the way that I could function. And, and I also had like, they don't like, they should give you like a booklet. Actually, you should get pregnant. And then every, the doctor you see, you should have to go see someone like immediately when the stick turns two two lines and they should hand you expecting better because that book yes like, i don't know if you read it I oh my did. god it's so good it's so good and i love how it like breaks down some things that are just like no this is really not a big deal and like some things are like actually this is kind of a big deal like you should kind of avoid this and for me i was like the thing that the moment that i started to panic was when i was getting my nails done like normal, like once a month I would go get a manicure. And then the, like when I hit the second trimester, I was like reading, I was listening to a podcast or something. Cause at a certain point I started just consuming all of the information. I started to panic and just like consume all the information, which is definitely not good for you. And it was like, you can't get your nails done. You can't dye your hair. You can't do any of this. And I was like, Oh my God, I've been getting my nails done. I've been getting my nails done every month. Like oh my God, what is this done? And I was just like, I totally lost it. And I feel like still to this day, I'll like, I don't know, Lila was like pretty late to, um, she, she was like, one of her, one side of her body was like kind of off. So she would crawl and drag one side of her body. And I was like, oh my God, it's because I got my nails done. It's because I got my nails done in the first trimester. <laughs> I just feel like there's things that, um, that they should just tell you like immediately. Because I know like you're not supposed to go to the doctor in theory until like three weeks in or something like that and it should be like immediately you should immediately have to go to the doctor and they should just hand you expecting better yeah I mean I couldn't agree more and I and I'm glad to hear I'm not glad to hear you completely panicked second trimester but I panic, I'm so and panicking when you start to get all that information it's all my you know it's all with hindsight and then you start and this is my biggest thing don't google of course I did I told everybody that I yep. was to do it and I did it and um, mostly <laughs> stuff like you know being sick and googling um and you can the, the things that come up as like top googled are if i have done this already is this a problem and you want the internet to tell you it's fine but it says things like well yes if you have done this then you shouldn't have done it um in the yeah. four weeks yeah. but you don't see i mean where i am based you don't see a midwife um for the most of that first trimester i think you see some maybe earliest 10 weeks and as you yeah. say that's often when a lot of changes have already happened and you're not armed with that information. Um, And I absolutely love um, Professor Emily Oster, who wrote Expecting Better. Um, I'm absolutely obsessed with her. I think she's brilliant. And for me, it was just that sort of rational explanation of things. And I and I think the point you made just there about the fact that she would say, actually, do you know what? You had a second cup of coffee. We really don't need to panic about that. But actually, if Mm -hmm. you do this, this does statistically hold a risk. So maybe just don't do it. And that became so, so useful. um, Yeah, for me and and clearly a lot of other women. 
And then I also interviewed um, another obstetrician later on in pregnancy. And she said something to me, which I just think is so, so useful just for life. And and she said, when people come through um, you know, the medical system, she said, and they see so, so many pregnancies, um, you know, some with you know really difficult complications some that are very smooth and she said um, a huge proportion of that time it has nothing to do with anything you've done it's not because you had your roots colored it's not because you did your nose it's not because you had five cups of coffee that one day she said but if you're the kind of person that is going to do that but then dwell on it and blame yourself and think it's you know gonna impact things she said just don't do it um which mm-hmm. i think for some things is is perfectly possible um if you are going to drink too much caffeine and then worry about it just don't have the caffeine um but i i kind of yeah i followed emily oster's um guidelines of you know um was it 200 milligrams a day um and kind of tried to stick to that and then and then not worry about it but but you do and and i think in the sense of zwift i mean i just I love Swift anyway, as you know. Like I'm like crazy. Oh, I just love going on Swift. And um God, it's just like it it just is amazing. Like I, I was doing the Kristen Armstrong and Danny Rowe have their postpartum pregnancy workouts on there. And I was just doing those and just love it, loving every second of it. I mean, it was just like it's just so useful as a tool for for anybody Uh, but like for me in that in that time like I loved it before in during the pandemic I like kind of fell in love with Zwift when you couldn't really ride outside but then through pregnancy it was like this whole new appreciation for just what it what it gave me in pregnancy and I just like oh I cannot even describe how much I love Zwift (laughs) oh I completely I completely agree it's brilliant and and I kept thinking that as well. I kept thinking, because I, I got to the point where I was predominantly on Zwift and I was doing a lot of gravel riding as well, which became my other obsession. Um, but Zwift for me, it, it sort of made me appreciate the fact that if it hadn't been for Zwift, I just wouldn't have been doing well, probably very much at all towards the very end mm-hmm. um, because obviously physically it becomes so difficult. And I was I was on Zwift. I was looking back actually at my, you know, you've got your activity history and I was thinking, oh my God, I think I was fitter than ever in pregnancy (laughs) because I was so worried about not being active. I became way way more active and I was probably doing three interval sessions a week, which is the Danny Rowe and and Kristen Armstrong um, ones because they give you the 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 sort of, um, what's the word they call it? A difficulty score, but that's not the word. And it just tells you, okay, this is, pretty safe intensity versus what you could got i think they said about 25 versus about 45 if you were going for a crazy yeah. interval session and constant reminders which you don't think you need but you do saying you know make sure you're drinking make sure your fans placed well on you and things like that and so i was still doing interval sessions on zwift at 41 weeks pregnant um how far did you make it <laughs> I mean, the baby only made it to 41 weeks before I was like, get her out because <laughs> we were both late. Um, yeah. But I think I made it until three days before her due date um, was the last time that I was able to ride Zwift. And it, and I think I could have kept going, but I was so... I mean, come on. Like, it's like... Anxious at that point. Yeah. I, I was like, at that You're point... You're saying that like you like... stopped after a week. <laughs> no I mean yeah I remember like going to a checkup three days before her due date and being like should I still be like riding an indoor bike and my doctor I think that she just had no idea what to do with me because she's only worked with like Spanish women who are just like can their main question is like can I have a glass of wine and I'm like can I keep riding my bike um but but I finally stopped riding three days before her due date because I was just I think I was just like so fed up at that point. That I was like, I cannot even be bothered <laughs> to get on the trainer. I think that's fine. Like three days before, <laughs> I don't think that yeah. sort of classes is lazy. Then I was like, at every, every single day, I was like, she'll come today. She's gonna come today. She's gonna come today. And then it hit like forty-one weeks, and I was like, no, if, if we're evicting her. Get her out. I- I just I'm done. <laughs> think it's absolutely crazy that we 
you give them what we do and you know the fact that we were just identical and we pretty much gave birth at the same time didn't we <laughs> yeah it's wild uh, this is what like we we were we touched on it a little bit like when we were at the tour we talked a little bit about how we both missed the first tour but obviously like we both gave birth a couple months before the inaugural Tour de France Femme of X Swift. So we both weren't on the ground for this massive event in women's cycling. And for the two of us who cover women's cycling, who love women's cycling, I felt so much FOMO. I mean, I was really having a hard time uh, watching it. The first like two stages, I was like, it's fine. It's totally fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and then the tears just started to come and it was every single day there were tears. And I was just like, oh man, I was having such a hard time. Yeah, and I, I think something else that a lot of people have sort of asked me about, spoken to me about along the way is, um, and I know this is a great, great luxury to even have on the agenda, but timing when you get pregnant. And I know that this sort of crosses over with big decisions for a lot of athletes thinking, well, when when's the Olympics, when's the world, what, what am I going to miss? And sort of trying to look at when you can get pregnant with respect to not missing something major on the calendar. And I had realized that with the career, you know, with the industry that we're in, you know, you can keep putting things off saying well, it's not the perfect time. It's not the perfect time. And it was one of those things where I thought, you know, um, obviously I was absolutely delighted to get pregnant. And then you start to sort of look at things that you're not sure if you're going to make it to them or not. And for us, as you say, the tour was one of those, and it was just such a huge you know, historical moment. And I had the hugest FOMO. But I was at, I don't know, I'd love to hear about you, you know, how you felt at that point. But I was actually convinced I was going to go. And I was like, trying to make it happen. I was too. And I, I was too. A, I was, yeah. I couldn't get a passport in time for, for Mila. <laughs> I yeah I was the same I was the same I I managed to get Lila a passport um but I was like well I need to bring a nanny because I'll be working so I need someone to hold Lila and then it wasn't it my boss was like okay well let me know let me know and then I feel like it was like 10 days before the tour I was sitting there and she was colicky so she just cried all the time like she never stopped crying unless she was asleep and it had to be on me and I was like I'm delusional <laughs> there's no way that I can drive around France for like a whole week with a baby that will not stop crying who only wants to breastfeed breastfeed like there's no way this is I'm being insane so it wasn't until a, literally a week before the race that I called Kaylee and I was like Kaylee I don't think I'm gonna make it to the Tour de France fam and he was like yeah I, I never booked anything for you <laughs> because <laughs> why is it so better. similar everybody else is saying to me yeah no there is no way you are going to be at any of these week after giving birth and I was still in I was still in hospital which is another story happy to share it if we have time and um yeah, I think it was more other people going, yes, of course you are. <laughs> of course you are <laughs> there in a week. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, no, nobody was surprised when, when I didn't make it. Um, but some things were possible for us, weren't they, that we didn't think we, we would be doing that quickly. So I definitely think it's, yeah, you've got to roll with reality versus expectation. Well, we both went to the tour this year, which was an amazing experience. I feel like it was almost better going this year because there was so there was similar amount of hype, but it felt different in that it was standalone. Like we talk about it a bit when the race started, but because it started in Claremont Ferrand, like we weren't connected to the men's race at all. So it had a very different vibe this year that I wouldn't have known, but uh, like obviously the people that we were around who did get to go to the race last year all can attest to how how different the feeling was for for the tour this year. What we got to experience all of it. We really did, and I know we're going to say it was better because obviously it was the one we we made it to. Um, <laughs> but what did you that made it better? Think? What did you think when there was the route announcement and it was going to be completely standalone from Paris? It didn't even really like phase me. Like I, I was kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think there was a moment when I was like, oh, it's kind of a bummer because for the women to start in front of the Eiffel Tower, like there's all these photos of them in 2022 standing in front of the Eiffel Tower doing sign on. And it's, they're just iconic photos. I mean, it's just like, it really puts into perspective that 
this race that we've been dying to have for so long like the women finally get to race the champs Elysees, but then keep going instead of just having it be this one day event mm. so i was i was maybe bummed for like a second because i didn't because i wanted to see the women race through paris and then i was like you know what no like this is awesome because this means that we can stand on our own. This means that we can have an event that is not constantly tied to the men's race, constantly compared to the men's race. Like we can start to distance ourselves while still having the benefits of the name Tour de France Femme. I don't know. What did you think? Yeah, it's it's interesting. And I think because, you know, during, obviously, as we've just said, during the first edition, you know, we were... Bit, a little bit busy um but a little bit tired and out of it um just a tad, and, I probably, tad a tad. and i and i probably gave less thought to it than i might have done otherwise um when you know when you have the kind of big reveal but i found that more people who um are kind of outside cycling circles people that don't follow the sport as closely as us have all said to me about this year's edition um oh my god like isn't that just awful though that it's not in Paris? And, and it wasn't until people, yeah, that, that don't follow cycling a lot have said, well, why, why isn't it exactly the same? Which again is another, is, is another story. Um, but I found that, yeah, people like yourself and other people who were there experiencing it kind of didn't even, it wasn't even a talking point, was it? Because, it, you know, the, the start was just brilliant. The presentations were fantastic and it, it was just such a brilliant race. So no, I don't think it, it became a talking point within the sport. I think it always would have been a talking point the first year that they moved That's away from true. Paris. But like next year, when it starts in a different country than the men finish, I think that it's not even... Well, the talking point will be that the race is starting in Rotterdam, not that the race is starting not in Nice, where the men will finish next year. So I think... Yeah. Yeah, like... It's interesting as the years go by, we're just going to distance. It's going to become more and more its own entity, which I think is a great thing. Mm-hmm. Like we can have races that are tied to the men's race in a way that they'll never be separate. Like Perry Bay Femme will always be, you know, the day before, maybe on the day. Who knows if they'll ever change that. I personally love that it's the day before because it just gives the women the entire day. There's no competing coverage. It's just completely for the women, and I love that. Um, but the, the, that's a race that's never going to be separated. Flanders as well. Like, they're always going to be tied together. But the Tour de France, like, we can have our own mm. our own space for that, which is really cool. Yeah, I'd agree with all, with all of that. And... Um... And I think on a personal note, I know you absolutely adored it as well. Just being there on the ground and following the race for the first time was, I mean, I think, again, people were quite, I don't know why, I think people were quite surprised when I said, I I genuinely think that was one of the best working experiences, if not the best experience I've had throughout. Hands down. 20 years of cycling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were working like insane hours. Like I was working from like 10 a.m. until 2 a.m. And I still when the race ended, I was like, no, 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 I want to keep going. Like I still had stories bouncing around my head. I I was still like it was incredible. And being away from Lila, I thought it was going to be so much harder. But it was like, obviously, I think you traveled before then for work. It was my first time away from her for more than 18 hours. So for me, it was like a huge a huge hurdle (laughs) in the beginning, just leaving her behind. And I cried the entire drive to Claremont Ferrand. I I cried the whole time. Like, I can't do this. I almost turned around multiple times. And then the first like day, it wasn't super busy. It was just like the day before the race. So there wasn't a lot going on. And I cried like all day. And then the race started and it was like, I had no time to miss her because it was so full on. But every single second of it was just an absolute joy and being in the press room with all of these incredible journalists who were focused on the women's race and incredible women who I just love their work. It was really cool. Like Sive, like, Oh my God, meeting her was, was kind of like, I don't know, meeting a professional rider. Like I was just like, Oh my God, Oh my God, she's amazing. (laughs) And, uh, it was really cool. It was so cool. It was just like, what an experience. I feel like, yeah, I, Looking ahead to next year, it's like I, I not 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 even a uh, thought in my mind that I could ever miss it. Yeah, uh, you're gonna make me cry. 
I've, I've got a photo which I'll, I'll share um, when this goes out and it's all of us in the press room together and yeah it honestly it's making me emotional now I mean not only the thought of the crying on the way to it because for me I'd been away I'd maybe done a couple of days consecutively in London and come back I had I had worked but I'd not like you I'd not done a big stint and that was by far the longest and you're thinking about you know I was exclusively breastfeeding for so long and then to think right I've got something in the calendar that's going to take me away for you know a week and a half and can you do it you just don't know how everybody's going to cope doing it and so that was a huge emotional um point for me um but I followed the same kind of journey as you of getting very very upset when I left and then just feeling just so excited to be back in a journalistic capacity chasing stories and and you know following that race which was just it did not disappoint any step of the way but that moment in the press room when I realized that I was just surrounded by yeah people that we we know very well people that you probably met for the first time and all in this little lovely gorgeous bubble of the Tour de France which we've all experienced so much on the men's side but not on the women's side so you've got all these brilliant journalists coming together um our first time covering the Tour de France fam Avec Zwift and it just made me just so so grateful because when I I mean it's scary that it is the best part 20 years ago um I did my first Tour de France presenting in 2007 um and it was not the friendliest place as a woman and so to sit in that press room with that much support and all just sort of rooting for each other was was really really special yeah yeah it was just it was just so cool I mean there was one day I think it was stage three when we were having a hard time getting from the press room to af- to the post finish area where the riders would be, where we could do post race interviews and stuff. And um, the ASO does not love journalists; they really like to make it hard for us to do our jobs. <laughs> Which, why? Like, why? Why? But we were all trying to get to the to the finish line, and the press room was on the course, and it was like really hard to get into the final kilometer to get to the finish line, and people kept getting turned around at a certain point we all were in one group together and it we just like stormed the finish line like we just all like got on the course and walked up the final like 500 meters into the into the finish and it was like such an incredible moment just like all of these badass women in like sports journalism just like no no you can't push us around like it was a th- it was a moment that i that lives in my mind rent free like it was so <laughs> such a cool moment and i mean i i'm really lucky that i have predominantly worked in women's cycling so i've not experienced as much backlash as you have as orla has like in working in men's I used to be on the the men's the uh, men's podcast at the other place where where I worked, and I would always get so much hate. Like Kaylee would always get more emails complaining about me talking about men's cycling than he got about anyone else. And and people the the, the go to insult would always be, "Well, she's only got this job because of who she's married to." Um, them not knowing that I have a degree. And I, I do, in fact, know what I'm doing, but um, you know, but I didn't get the something. kind of like just, I know a tiny bit. Like, I, yeah, I can get by, <laughs> um, but I didn't. I I never. I very quickly gravitated to only covering women cycling, and I think part of it is because I just I was like, you know what, I can't be fussed with the backlash that any female gets. But I do want to talk to you about this because obviously you've done way more work in men's cycling and you've got to experience the the joy of men on the internet. (laughs) Oh, men on the internet. Well, so going back to what we were just saying about that kind of moment where I I took a picture, didn't I, in the press room because we were all uh, having a bit of a laugh comparing our nails after we 
kind of dealt oh. with that topic and um it's a great great conversation yeah. this, anyway anyway no one we go people can go back and listen to that extensive episode about uh shellac nails but um you know, we took a photo, we were in the press room, we had a moment of lull before it got into, you know, the, the heat of the action towards the end of the stage, had a moment catching up and talking, yeah, about what, what nail designs we had for the tour. Some people had matched the yellow jersey, hadn't they? And we had a bit of a joke and we took a picture and we put it on the internet and it was lovely. And it made me, again, realise that I always have hesitation with saying anything like that in that environment because in the past I would get well why on earth are you here if you're going to mention like your nails or your hair or you know the fact that you're a woman and you know we need to ignore all these factors because you've got to prove your credibility as a cycling journalist um and I think that the fact that we are so much more secure now in our space and what we do that it really doesn't matter if we mention on a podcast that we've got our nails done. I would like to think no one's going to write in and say that that devalues what we do as a career or our professionalism or our nails of what we're talking about. And it it struck me that time and time again, men on the internet, um, I would just have people asking questions of me, and this won't surprise you, my credentials to be in that seat to be talking about pro cycling or talking about tech in particular tech was a very difficult space because my male counterparts were never asked the same questions and they weren't receiving the level of abuse that I was and it was horrendous and I probably only realize how horrendous now when I don't get that extent of abuse but I used to and it makes me realize that you know even now if you came into the industry and got that, it would it would be quite shocking. But we all, you know, you mentioned all of myself and her, known each other for a long time, and we just started putting up with so much of it. Um, and the fact that we can be more vocal now and share our journey through the sport from quite a young age when we both came into it, I think is really important. And and that was the biggest thing on any level, whether it was abusive or it was, you know, just a reader viewer listener a question it would be why are you here or well, prove prove that you know what you're talking about constantly and as i say that was never that was never asked of anybody else purely the fact and you know god forbid you you dress in an, in a feminine way because that devalues you even more and that's why i'm just so on board with all of us saying do you know what I'm going to i'm going to be in the press room and i'm going to wear a dress and i might even mention that i'm wearing a dress but then that was my favorite nice. part. Oh my god, my favorite part of the tour. Well, one of my favorite parts was just wearing baby, like ba- clothes I can't wear around a baby. And I, I had yeah. so much fun. I had so much fun packing for the tour. I was like, I'm gonna wear skirts. I'm gonna wear dresses. I'm gonna wear really nice tops that aren't gonna have vomit on them. <laughs> I'm like, I was just like so excited. Yeah. That's why I did the outfit of the day. Like nothing I wore was like brown groundbreaking. But it was just like so fun and and being in the press room with everybody, like everyone just gave me compliments and it was just like, oh, I feel so like lifted by all these yeah. people. And and I mean, even people who, who follow me on, on Instagram, they were even like, s- people were loving it, like people who just listen to the podcast. And I was just like, man, this would never happen if it was the men's tour ever because the only time I've ever covered the men's tour, it was for two stages. And the amount of comments I got about how I was only like, I only got my job because of Tom's. I was like, yeah, I'm out. I I, like, I have so much respect for you and Orla for like pushing through and just like overcoming all of that. Because for me, I I immediately caved. I was like, not, not my space. I'm not going to deal with it. But man, you two have just like really, been groundbreaking in making carving out a a space for for women to cover men's sport and it's just been so cool to watch for someone who's like a fan of you a fan of her and also a fan of men's sport like to feel like okay maybe now if I felt like I wanted to go back to that space like I would feel a little bit more secure in it and it's because of you guys (laughs) this <laughs> is becoming a very emotional <laughs> conversation um thank you for saying that and i think that you know it does take so much resilience but people yeah you know, all has been so so significant for me 
having that confidence as well because if there's more than one of you <laughs> you're moving in the same direction obviously which is where we felt at the, at the Tour de France fam you know it, it's so significant and it just changes your mindset and I would like to think that you and I would feel a lot happier to go to the Tour de France now and walk into that press room with the conviction that we know we're good at our jobs and actually I have a floral dress on and let's not let's not dwell on that and I would like to think we'd be more comfortable and confident in that space I went through a long period of time and you could even look back at the you know content I was presenting at the time and because the comments got to me and you know people say just don't read any of it but when you're doing a lot of digital content you can't not see it you can't um you can't yeah they're right it's not. your posts uh, promoted posts um, of you know, video clips all over social media and bam you just see it on your feed even if you're actively trying to not indulge it not respond to it not you will see some of it and it started to affect me and you can see me go from my kind of natural style to I actually did a I did a tech shoot in a massive baggy men's like gray jumper um and baggy trousers because I was so fed up with having to defend my figure my physique the way I looked the way I dressed um how I came across physically that I just couldn't deal with any more comments about my appearance I never had a comment on my content no one ever said that was an interesting point you just made about <laughs> inner tubes whatever it was always I never said anything interesting about inner tubes but it was it was always about my appearance maybe that's where I went wrong no it was always about my appearance and I got so fed up with it I thought you know what on next video I'm going to wear baggy men's clothes so no one can see my size no one can see what I look like so I'm just going to hide and it makes me so sad to say that that was the case and I went through this phase and I wore baggy polo shirts and trainers and I wore big baggy jumpers even though growing up and even as a bike racer I would turn up to track league and a dress and then change into my kit you know I didn't feel like I had to hide it as a bike rider until I came into this industry and was just abused from every online angle until I just wanted to hide who I was and hide myself so then starting to you know overlap with people like Orla and then start working together and getting to know each other as friends it made me stop apologizing for myself and realize that I didn't I I didn't want to I didn't want to dress like that so why was I doing it well because I was just getting fed up with the bombardment but then the more she would come to a cycling event or a cycling tv coverage wearing a dress well I thought well I'm going to wear a dress as well and it oh it's it makes me so sad that we were both in that position but happy that it is it is changing yeah I mean she's just like un unreal like she is. man I have so much respect for her and also she's just so good at what she does so good it's it's so cool but we also need to talk about how you went from the the tour de France femme working every single day the entire time straight into the world championships or then you talked for like eight hours a day straight to yourself because I can't <laughs> once I came once I got home from the tour and I had that like post tour come down I was like I actually can't touch my computer for a week I need a break but you just you just kept going um well something I've been thinking about is that we shouldn't make things look too easy on social media. And it's something I don't, <laughs> I don't talk enough about the night that you've cried because you're leaving your baby for the first time or um, the fact that, like, logistically, it, it, it would it had just become comedy, how, how logistically difficult it was for me to get from the Tour de France fam to the world's. And so I had basically pre-packed all my suitcases for like different jobs. And I'm like, obviously trying to pre-look at the weather forecast. So we were going from what turned out to be pretty decent weather, didn't it? Across the tour. Yeah. And then we- Everything but the tourmalade. Well, there was that. Oh gosh, I could talk, I could talk all day about the tourmalade day. Uh, I was not prepared for the tourmalade day. Um, that was a day that was, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't ready. 
Mm. I was so ready. I changed into a welly boots and a packer mac halfway up. <laughs> I was so. I was. That was the day that I wore like really. I got go in in prep for the for the tour. I got a couple new outfits, and one of them was this pair of loafers from Reformation that I'd been eyeing for <laughs> months and they went out of stock and then I had an alert set. And so they came back in stock and I was like, I'm wearing those to the tour. And within two days of the tour starting, I was like, I can't wear those. I am going to get blisters like you've never seen if I wear those. Cause we walk so much. And then I wore them on the tourmalade day because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you look so good. You know, I took them off. I, t- I did. I put them in my backpack and put my tennis shoes on when we got to the top of the tourmalade because I was like, this is nuts. You are wearing you are wearing the practical footwear in my in my photo in the photo. Think, Great photo. No, I think about it. I will go. I will try and remember what we were originally talking about. But my <laughs> my one of my favorite moments is this the tourmalade day. And again, it genuinely makes mm. me emotional looking back at it because it was just the best day. It was just incredible. And we'd had, we'd basically been told, um, sort out your logistics for getting to the top of the mountain because once race day is on, you can't just scoot up in your hire car. And um, what did we do? Well, we ended up having to leave the car. Oh, I forgot about this. And walk up the tourmalade. Yeah, because somebody wouldn't just take the chairlift that was right there. Oh, oh, okay. So I, I am a little bit hot on health and safety, and I just felt like they just, I just wasn't happy getting on those chairlifts. How did you? Yeah, feel? Matt and I, Matt and I took the chairlift. We were kicking our feet, having a great time going up the chairlift. So I missed out. Yeah, I just got on with it. it. Nice. Didn't feel a little bit out of season, unmaintained, and rickety, you no. Know? No, they they uh they take pretty good care of those things. Okay, okay. Well, that's on me. But the moral of the story is, I think one of the best moments was the jeopardy of not knowing if we were going to make it to the top on foot before the race got there. And not only professionally did we want to be able to podcast um from the top, um that's where the TV was as well. Caught halfway through the peloton you know um so yeah. we walked up and we met so many people on the way it was brilliant we were literally just soaking wet with like mist and rain but also just sweating so much from like underestimating how hard it is to walk several kilometers up and down a mountain um but i think i love moments like that because you end up just having to do it the hard way but it's always just <laughs> always like rewarding and hilarious i think we were exhausted by the time we saw you the benefit that you got was actually seeing the fans because taking the lift up and being at the top, you had no idea how many people were on the roads because the the fog was so thick. Like it was like, okay, there are no fans on this mountain because you couldn't see anything. Like it wasn't until the riders started coming through that you could hear the sound of the fans down below. But because of the fog, it was like, it felt like we were just all on our own up there on that mountain. It was really surreal. And I and that is exactly it. Jokes aside, we met so many fans and you just got a feel for those beautiful images that you see when the riders come through the fans and going up and seeing them just gathering there and hearing like, you know, the groups of people with their cool boxes of beer and the, you know, ghetto blaster I don't think we call them that anymore music um but it was yeah it was just an absolute joy but going back to your original question um yeah basically yeah because we had good weather at the tour back. and it was hot and then we went to Scotland we went to and it was Scotland. not hot and it was chucking it down um so I'd kind of had to preempt the weather for Scotland pack a massive suitcase because I was um on the host broadcast for the UCI so obviously um going from podcast to being in vision on television i had to make sure i was packing different outfits for every day so the packing i think was the biggest part of all of it um <laughs> was just um yeah bouncing kind of from from one long job to another um but i love a challenge and it was just it was just brilliant i think because the women's racing was so good at the worlds as well coming straight off the, back oh. of the second tour for me again I just, I was pinching myself. Um, yeah, that I had the opportunity to be at the heart of all of it, talking about it every day, um, which is an absolute dream 
but also having the level of racing to talk about. You know, I think it becomes a cliche that people go, oh, isn't that a great race? Isn't that a great race? But it, and it truly was, wasn't it? There wasn't a dull moment. We had so much to talk about, so much drama unfolding and so many dynamics. And um, yeah, I, I, it was just an utter joy that whole time. I mean, for for us, we got really spoiled by the tour worlds back to back that were just unbelievably good. Every single day of the tour was like, could not have been scripted. There was drama off the bike. There was drama on the bike. It was like unbelievable. And then we turned around and went to the the worlds where, you know, the rider that won was the rider we all knew was going to win. But the way in which it happened was so exciting that it was, you wouldn't have even, like you couldn't take anything away from the race because we knew what the outcome was going to be. Yeah, completely agree. And it was the right person. And you got Mila, Mila got to come with you to the Worlds. <laughs> she did. So the day one in the Hilton, Glasgow, um, she auto-called reception um, about mm. 25 times before I realized what she'd done. <laughs> so I'm like, no, I don't. I wasn't calling for anything. Uh, like <laughs> unraveled every bit of the toilet roll, like mm. wait, like face planted into the shower. Like she, um, she had a whale of a time in the Hilton, um, but it was really special. And she, yeah, she got lifted on the shoulders to see the end of the racing, and um, it was, it was really, really lovely having her there. I, yeah, being away. If we had, if it hadn't been in Scotland, completely back to back, um, that would have been very, very difficult. But it was great to have her there. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't even mention the the massive delay at the airport trying to get from France to the Worlds. Um, I almost didn't get let out of Toulouse because I said my my <laughs> the last time I'd been there, like my um, I hadn't got my stamp. So um, oh no, yeah, they didn't they didn't want me to leave Toulouse, and then the flight was massively delayed. So we were just basically asleep on this big um, red sofa in the airport thinking, are we going to make it to the worlds or not? So it was just- I actually remember seeing this. I remember seeing this on social media, <laughs> but you made it. I barely. made it. I made it. Um, and yeah, everything, everything is so much more challenging to make sure that you're, yes, doing the right thing and spending time with your, your little one as well. So it's, um, yeah, but she's had an exciting time <laughs> as I know that Lila has as well. Yeah. She had a great time with the world. There was some, some, well, we both got COVID, which was not super fun. Um, and I was messaging you about it the whole time because you had experience and I was like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. This is terrible, but we, we came out of it fine. But yeah, like watching the men's race, she just like, she gets so excited. Like, I think she can just feel the energy so she like stand there and clap and like go like ah ah and it's just really cute oh i love it i love it me mila goes <gasps> like she gets so excited i just love that <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man it's great it's so great and you you've been you kept going you're still <laughs> you're still working you're still traveling so what are you up to now yeah so i've um for the first time been covering triathlon this year um so i've been presenting from super league triathlon series and that's been broadcast on eurosport and discovery plus and it's just concluded out in Saudi Arabia. So I've literally just come back. <laughs> um, and before that, we were in Malibu, Toulouse. They let me back in despite the stamp thing. Um, mm. and, um, and London. So yeah, we've had a few incredible rounds. And I've, I've really, really loved just delving into, I think, yeah, it's a different sport, but obviously the huge crossover with the with the massive element of cycling and so often in the format of Super League, um the technicality of the bike course or like we had in the desert, like massive, massive wins. Um, for me it's given me something that I know very well, but there's such an you know, another huge element to it that I've had to kind of really delve into and research and learn and that's been really really exciting and the racing again has just been amazing um yeah and for anyone that doesn't know the super league format it's basically it's just so fast and furious they do different race formats but the what we've just seen in neon is three triathlons back to back with no with no gap with no break so they're just like 
three disciplines, three disciplines, three disciplines, finish. And it's just on from the gun. And I've never seen anything like it. It's it's so entertaining. Oh, man. Okay, I'll have to check it out. I've, I've watched a triathlon in my time, but mostly because I'm a big fan of Flora Duffy. I went to college with her, so I got to cheer her on. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap up the episode. I'm sure that we could keep talking like for another hour. Yeah, we could. But there's so, there's things we didn't even get to get to. But we should wrap it up with what we're obsessed with. So, do you have anything anything good? Oh, I love this part. Um, I do, I do. Um, Apple TV. I've been. I've just finished watching. I think it's called The Supermodels. Um, mm. it's about the original Supermodels. Um, Cindy Crawford, Naomi Campbell, um, Linda Evangelista. Uh, Christy Turlington, the other ones. And the reason I am obsessed with it is because I I love it. It's a candid documentary series. I absolutely love it. But there's, for me, quite a huge crossover with the changes we've seen in cycling because they were saying if they were to come into the industry and um, you go for casting to try and be a model now, they didn't think any of them would have made it. Um, because Cindy Crawford was saying that she was seen as as a little bit quirky and she had what was now you know referred to as the beauty mark but in the beginning they were saying we're going to have to photoshop your face and actually by model standards she was quite curvy and they were and and she actually said I want to go and get a degree and then I want to come back and see if I can make it as a model and all of them had these really interesting starts in modeling and were all told like you know you're not you're not um i guess uh, what's the word i'm looking for they they weren't homogenous they weren't you know just going to look the same as the next person and they all had these incredible careers that just changed um the fashion industry and they were saying yeah now they don't think any of them would have made it because they that's not what people look for now in order anyway it, it got me thinking about kind of generations and how you can make it in your chosen field and if you look back to Victoria Pendleton um, on the track in the UK, it was similar for her in that you know, she showed huge, huge talent and they invited her on to the Great Britain program that she wanted to go and get an education. So they paused it for her while she went and got a three-year degree and then she came back and the rest is history and won everything there is to win. Um, but would that be possible now um, for a young person that wants to to do these things? Anyway... Watch the uh, watch the series if you have Apple. It's fascinating, but also I think it it was a really interesting take on the times we're in and and how you know career pathways change. Yeah, that's really interesting. I I feel like it wouldn't be possible now. Like the sport is moving so fast that it's not every year the level is up and up and up, and the only way to keep up is to be in it, like to be experiencing the changes in your legs, in your fitness. It's like. Yeah, it, everything is happening just right now. Absolutely. But it's an, yeah, interesting concept. I'm home with my family, so we've been introducing my sister's partner and, and my husband to family classics. Um, so we've been having movie nights, and it includes old-timey candy, uh, like... Um, what, what are, I can't remember what they're called, but they're like the, there's like powder, and then you have a stick, and you dip this, you lick the stick, and dip it in the powder. It's really gross. Dip, 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 dip. Yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds right. Um, and like <laughs> pop rocks, pop rocks and stuff. And so we've been having movie nights, and the movie we watched last night was Young Frankenstein, which is a Mel Brooks classic. It is phenomenal. Uh, if you've seen any Mel Brooks movies, I think the most famous one is probably Spaceballs, but Young Frankenstein is just, uh, the jokes are so bad and so good. And some of it just really doesn't hold up in the modern lens, but it is just very good. Yes. Uh, my sister and I watched it for the first time when I think we were like seven and four. My mom was like, oh, they'll love it. It's funny. And it's black and white. So we immediately thought it was a horror movie. And then neither of us could sleep for like a week afterwards. Um, so it's funny to watch it now with the perspective of the first time we saw it, we thought it was a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, but yeah, Tom's only laughed two times the entire movie. And I was like, bro. But do you do the thing on. where you watch? Like, why aren't you and I watch this him? It's more funny, yeah. Yes, for sure. Because I've seen it so many times that I could quote all the all the jokes. 
And so I'm watching him like, is he going to find this funny or not? Yeah, and then you anticipate it coming up and he doesn't look like he's engaged. Are you like, come on, focus. This sounds, <laughs> sounds really fun. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough for being here. This has been just so great to chat with you. And, and yeah, we could definitely keep going. So I'll have to have you back on at some point. <laughs> thank you so much for having me.